All righty, I'll pass it off to you guys if you want to get started. Wonderful. Good morning, Colt. Thank you for joining us early uh, this morning. It is never too early, in fact, to talk trash. So that's what we're going to do um, today. We'll discuss some strategies for creating non-disposable assignments. But first, we're going to introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Rachel Dagman Simonetta. I'm a senior instructor in the Department of English and the Division of uh, Continuing Education. I'm Nikki Jobin. Um, I teach for the History Department and the Stories and Societies Residential Academic Program at CU Boulder. And I'm Carolyn Sinkinson. I'm a teaching and learning librarian in the University Libraries. Great, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Nikki, Carolyn, and I are a part of a group called CAMP, which stands for Col Collective to Advance Multimodal Participatory Publishing. And the three of us have found inspiration in one another and through our shared participation in the three-year innovation incubator that's funded and supported by ASSET uh, at CU Boulder. In that team, we've worked to emphasize open educational practices. And today we wanted to share some of what we've learned uh, and produced with you all. So I think our outline for today's session is that we will um, start by discussing open pedagogy, uh, and then we will uh, define and discuss disposable assignments. And then we'll uh, move into two examples and experiences. I'll share uh, some information from my upper division English course, and then Nikki will talk about some of her history courses, and then we'll end uh, with some time for you all to discuss and share your experiences. And to start, what we thought we would ask all of you uh, to do is to take a moment to consider the term renewable assignment. When we say that term, we're wondering what kinds of words or phrases uh, come to mind as you hear that language. And to facilitate your responses, we've created a quick answer garden that you may be familiar with. You can enter up to 40 characters in each of your responses. And we've added a link to that answer garden in the chat. If you want to go ahead and click on that and open it up in a browser, we'll give you a moment or two to consider that prompt. What words or phrases come to mind when you hear the term renewable assignment? Eco projects, adaptable, same but different per student, windmills, repeating, useful, resourceful. These are great responses. Repeatable with modifications, useful into the future, OER, Wikipedia, crowdsourced, wonderful. Longevity, like that. Students can return to them. Wonderful. Iterative. Great. It seems like you all are, are right in sync with our, with our thinking as well. And, and to start the session, what we wanted to do is to invite you all to travel back in your memory a bit and recall a time when you were a student and maybe consider a particular project or assignment that you devoted a lot of energy and work into and and then submitted to a teacher for a grade so take a moment to kind of think about can you remember the effort that you put into it and the hours upon hours that stacked up as you completed and composed it and now we'll ask you can you say where that work is now is it filed away in a filing cabinet archived in a hard drive or even more sad ended up in a trash bin. Um, and, and what our reasoning for inviting you to recall that moment is to kind of really re-experience what many of us have felt as students when we co compose and create solely for the grade or for the audience of one, our teacher or our assessor. And that is really the focus of our talk today, the idea of ditching 
those disposable kinds of assignments in favor of renewable alternatives. And as many of you may know, the term disposable assignments was really coined by David Wiley, a leading scholar in the field of open education. And a number of his blog posts and talks, he coined that term and called attention to these inherited practices that we do, where students extend a great deal of energy, intellectual energy and otherwise, only to have content thrown into the trash. He characterizes these materials, as you can see on the quote on screen, as things that both students and faculty complain about. And he sees them as not adding any value to the world, and in fact, taking value from it. And he calls on educators like ourselves to transform practices and assignments. And that really leads us to open education. Um, as probably many of you know in this room today, the open education movement has done enormous work and made great strides in transforming the cost of course materials through open educational resources that's resulted in millions of dollars in savings for students. And this work is, is really astounding and really hopeful, but more transformation is possible a transformation of how we teach and how we position teachers and students in relation to one another. And as we think about this, we call on inspiration from educational philosophers like Paulo Freire, who imagined students as co-investigators alongside their teachers, rather than an empty vessel into which knowledge is deposited, right? Or we can look to someone like Maxine Green, who talks about the social imagination where teachers and students together imagine more just and equitable futures, both in the classroom and beyond. For me, both of these uh, thinkers and, and speakers about education really capture the spirit of the open education movement and the pedagogical transformation that the early advocates, oops, sorry, early advocates imagined. This quote um, that's on the screen may be familiar to you. It comes from the Cape Town Open Education Declaration. And you can see there that the authors are really imagining a future where everyone can contribute to the knowledge commons. And not only that, a future where new pedagogies emerge, where teachers and learners are doing that together in a sort of mutual quest. So as you can see, this vision moves beyond materials and OER to also include transformative pedagogy what many refer to as open pedagogy, which is really just leveraging open licenses and open technologies to approach education in a new way. It's really an educational orientation that centers on the learner and the learner's engagement with both broader publics and knowledge construction. So that's kind of our introduction to open pedagogy and situating it in the open education movement. But what does that really mean? Like, what does that look like in the classroom. So open pedagogy changes a few practices for both teachers and for learners. And so what we wanted to do now is highlight some of those changes and share a few examples that will hopefully illustrate what that means. So firstly, open pedagogy asks educators to find and create content that leaves a space for students to contribute as well. And so the example we chose to illustrate this comes from a, a science course at Roger Williams University. And rather than having students create textual reports or research papers that were filed away, students composed websites that semester to semester, cohort to cohort, students built and built and built, and ultimately created this wonderful resource for future students. Open Pedagogy also asks educators to like abandon or in the spirit of this talk to ditch that expert stance in favor of the students growth and participation and a really wonderful example of that comes from Robin DeRosa at Plymouth State University where she ditched a really expensive anthology that had been created by experts in the field and instead invited her students to go out and find public domain versions of the text and then they themselves wrote critiques and introductions and so on. Thirdly, open pedagogy asks educators to um, model uncertainty, right? The, the curiosity and the answering of questions 
alongside their learners. This example I love, it comes from um, an art history professor at the University of Wisconsin. She was tasked with teaching a course on Frank Lloyd Wright and admittedly shared this was not her field of research. And so she saw it as this wonder opportunity to co-investigate with her students. And so they went out to the Frank Lloyd houses and sites and created um, recordings of those sites and their structures and composed a text. To her, the benefit was that students could feel invested in the work they were creating. But additionally, she then had this source she could use with future students as well. And it's not just um, with teachers that things change, but with students as well. So open pedagogy encourages or invites students to share their work beyond the instructor. And someone captured, captured this in the answer garden. There are tons of examples out there of using Wikipedia to reach that goal. In this particular example that we're highlighting, it was a women in medicine course where students wrote biographies of physicians, healers, and scientists. So one, it served to counter the gender bias that exists in Wikipedia, but also allow students to see their work realized in the broader knowledge commons. Another component of open pedagogy is inviting students to approach unresolved, real world, authentic problems. And I love this example too. Um, this comes from the University of British Columbia. There was a class that saw this need to have case studies for students to engage with. So students, faculty, librarians, and others were invited to identify these real world problems, create reports, and submit it to this wonderful collection of case studies that since 2015 has grown quite a bit and is of use to many disciplines and many classes. And the third point that we'll highlight about open pedagogy is it does really want to bring students into the design, the sculpting, the molding of their own learning. And that might include um, drafting or composing assignments or learning objectives or even grading schemes. The example we chose here comes from the open pedagogy notebook where an instructor, rather than issuing a syllabus at the start with preconceived objectives together with her students, compose the objectives for the course and from her perspective that meant that the content of the course was deeply in accordance with the interests and aptitudes and preferences of the particular learners in her classroom at that time so those are just a few really brief captures of kind of the essence of open pedagogy and the way that might be enacted in the classroom there are many many more um, we'll share a link to our slides shortly and each of these slides link to those examples. And on this slide, we link to another guide where you can explore some more, including the wonderful resource, the Open Pedagogy Notebook. But we now have the privilege of hearing from two really wonderful teachers at CU Boulder and their own experiences in this work in their classrooms. So I'll hand it off now to Rachel. Great, thank you so much, Carolyn, for that introduction. Uh, and I loved all of the cross-disciplinary examples. Um, so as Carolyn mentioned, I'm gonna uh, focus in a little bit more uh, just on two classes that I have taught uh, in the English department at CU Boulder. So my first attempt at creating a non-disposable assignment emerged out of a two-day pedagogy workshop um, that I attended at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC in 2016. The session was focused on leveraging technology to teach William Shakespeare's plays in uh, the undergraduate classroom. Next slide, please. Thank you. So first, a little background. At the time, the Folger Shakespeare Library posted open copies of Shakespeare's plays. And here you can see an example of Twelfth Night where you can read or buy the play. Um, on the website. And I thought that these texts were extraordinarily important because the free downloadable versions could cut down on textbook costs for students. So I intended to use the free editions in my classes and then realized that the online text didn't contain any of the critical textual apparatus that you need uh, when you're teaching Shakespeare to undergraduates. So here I mean historical, um, cultural, and even linguistic explanations. Um, so uh, let me show you what I mean by that. Uh, next slide, please. Here's an example of the current HTML version of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night um, on the left side of the page. And if a user 
uh, clicks on the little yellow quill up at the top, you'll see the note on the right about how the editorial glosses only exist in the print versions. So that is in the paper books that cost students money. Uh, and also that to my mind, represent forms of academic gatekeeping that I'm uh, seeking to resist. So I decided that if the Folger digital texts weren't working, I could teach undergraduate students how to generate their own annotations of Shakespeare's plays. Next slide, please. So I began at the Shakespeare CoLab, which is a collaborative digital learning environment for Shakespeare studies. I partnered with two of our English PhD students, Melanie, uh, Melanie Lowe and Noden Desayon, to design a series of assignments that would prepare students both in uh, intro level and upper division courses to write open annotations for the plays. Next slide, please. So we started out by focusing on very traditional assignments in Shakespeare studies. So things like etymology, close reading, visual and performance studies, interacting with archives and analysis of secondary scholarship. So students in our classes have the tools to engage in traditional research in our field. And they can also opt in to publish their annotations on the CoLab website if they wish. Next slide, please. So here's an example of what the Shakespeare CoLab version of Twelfth Night looks like on the left. Uh, and so you can see that what started as a traditional assignment grew into uh, a non-disposable assignment because learners have the option um, to publish their research. And I also find that the stakes are higher uh, and the uh, quality of the work is um, better when learners know that they have the opportunity to publish their research on an academic site uh, that someday hopefully might become a student generated textbook um, rather than ju them just handing in an assignment to me um, for me to grade. And so let me show you one more example of how the collab um, grew. So another goal uh, of the Shakespeare collab was to teach students basic HTML. Uh, just to give them a familiarity with the backside of a web page. And this is partially because our team had to learn, uh, sometimes the hard way, uh, how to take the Folgers digital texts, um, their detailed HTML to create our own digital edition. So if you look at our uh, version of the play, if you could go back one slide, please, Carolyn. Thank you. Uh, you'll see on the left side, highlighted keywords that signal annotation. So let's focus our attention on that word or see no. Um, highlighted in red on the left side of the page. If the user clicks on that word, the image on the right, which is research done by a student pops up. Um, next slide, please. So here's what you see on the back side of the web page uh, and the block editor. And here I'm using WordPress, uh, which is the box with HTML. You can see Orsino down in the very last line in all caps. And for those of you who know HTML, uh, you'll recognize the underlying tab, thank you. Um, and also the SG pop-up ID code. So that code refers to a pop-up that we built using a plugin in WordPress called the Pop-Up Builder. And the plugin generates an individual code for each pop-up. And I have included an example at the bottom of the page there. Um, so as you see in the screenshot, uh, the code for Orsino happens to be uh, 2202, uh, which appears in the HTML code up top. Um, scene one is 2203 and so on. So as the HTML suggests at the click event, the designated pop-up appears. So I took this little example uh, and grew this seed um, into the a larger idea of student-generated academic digital editions um, that I created into uh, a separate class uh, called Digital Editions and Web Publishing. So for the final project in this particular course, students created a WordPress digital edition of a text of their choice, um, as long as in the spirit of DeRosa, uh, it's from the public domain. So meaning it is published before 1925. Um, and these are two ex uh, examples. On the left-hand side, you see um, a landing page uh, on examining T.S. Eliot. Um, and they chose a wide range of texts from uh, Charlotte Perkin Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper to T.S. Eliot. On the right, you see uh, a few poems from Edgar Allan Poe's uh, poetry. Uh, and that particular project is where I'll wrap up today. Uh, it's a project called Poe's Place, um, which I think was memorable for failing forward and for thinking outside the box. So this particular student really struggled uh, to replicate the formal aspects of the Raven 
of Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven using HTML. And I realized in the midst of their irritation uh, that they were really grappling with the form, with the stanzas, with the spacing in a way that they wouldn't do in a conventional essay where they would just read the poem and make some observations about the form. This screenshot on the right also illustrates the student's etymological research of the phrase nevermore, uh, which first appears in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles in 1223, and then is taken up later by Milton uh, in Paradise Regain Regained in the phrase, um, he nevermore will set foot in paradise. And Poe then takes up this phrase and sets it in the mouth of the raven. So in addition to tracing the history of the word, the student discovered actually that ravens can mimic um, human speech. And so you can see the image there on the right of a YouTube video uh, and the page links to a raven saying, uh, say nevermore, waka, 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 uh, which is yes, mildly disturbing. It's this weird moment, right? Where uh, Edgar Allan Poe meets the Muppets. Um, but the real point here, I think, is that the final exercise in creating this multimodal text was much more memorable for the student than a simple close reading assignment would have been. Uh, my guess is that they remember uh, that phrase nevermore in a different way than they otherwise would have. I certainly do. So uh, next slide, please. I'll finish up uh, by sharing just a few lesson learns or suggestions um, that I have uh, for those who wanna do this kind of work. One is that collaboration, uh, at least for me, is really key. Uh, two is that I try to model the collaborative process for the students. So rather than collaborating with colleagues and then handing the product or the um, final assignment uh, in final form to the student, I bring learners into the process as both collaborators and contributors. Uh, and then finally, fail forward, uh, that phrase from John Maxwell that um, Blair, Blair Young and JC uh, and Asset like to remind us of uh, an Asset in Incubator, which reminds me to take risks, to fail, uh, to learn to try again, and then to empower my students to do the same. Um, so thank you for listening to my examples and I'll hand it over to Nikki. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so Rachel has worked a lot with um, upper division students and um, I teach in the residential academic programs and there we're mainly dealing with first year students. And so I wanted to give you some examples from working with CU undergraduates. Um, in history courses, but particularly students who are not necessarily majors, who are not necessarily um, ever going to take another history course again. And you might think this might be a really difficult population to work with on something like a non-disposable assignment that could lead to something um, more permanent on the web. So um, let's go to the next slide. Um, my thought for all of this in, in working with CAMP and working with our um, multimodal publishing uh, collective that we have has always been sort of trying to figure out what's the balance between an assignment that gets across something you really need to do in a class to, to grapple with your discipline, but also make it something that can potentially turn into uh, something public facing or something authentic that could live on beyond just the assignment that gets thrown in the waste paper basket. And one of the ways to do this with uh, first year students in particular is maybe not to go for the high end of analysis as much as think about how to collect things. And so um, for many of my examples here, what you'll see is e examples of curation, um, digital exhibits, um, using sort of images with text as a way to get students to think about uh, the, the topic and put to use some of the knowledge that they're gaining in the course but not necessarily to, to do it as an expert, right? Um, so let's go to the next. Um, so th the goals here are always to create high uh, standards, but appropriate level standards to the students. Um, one of the things that I'm really adamant about, and you notice that Rachel also said this, that, that there's an opportunity to make, to publish. It is not necessarily a requirement. Um, I never make the grade contingent on uh, making their contributions public, although they do have to go through the same um, experience of putting together the page as if they were going to, to publish. Um, and then uh, offering a lot of choice, offering students uh, opportunities to sort of pick what angle or what aspect they want to talk about within a given assignment. And so, you know, we have to keep within the, the topic area of the course, but I try to make sure that they have a, a, an opportunity to feel ownership, that it's something that intrigues them or interests them that they're going to be working on. 
So we'll go to the next slide. Um, so I've got a couple different examples. I, you'll notice that they're kind of all over the place. That's because I teach um, about six courses a year, <laughs> and I've tried various iterations of this with different levels of or different uh, groups of students in different classes. Um, so the first couple examples here are Omeka exhibits. Um, Omeka is a uh, platform that some of you may be familiar with. We actually have an iteration of it with um, CU Buffs Create, which means that I have a platform where I've created an Omeka S site, um, and then I create digital exhibits for um, each class within that site. So these are a couple examples from my very first attempt at this type of exercise. Um, these are students that we went to special collections in Norland Library. Um, we looked at items that were related to World War I and World War II when we were there. And both of these exhibits that you're looking at um, decided to work with posters. There's some beautiful striking posters that we have um, in the archives at, at Norlin. Um, and so we brought several of those up and they were laid on tables around the room uh, along with other materials. But these are, are good because you can really see what the students were looking at. And you'll notice that, that in each of these cases, the students picked a couple of posters, they picked a theme around the posters that they thought they could talk about, they did some research, and literally this writing is not very long. This is, this is three paragraphs, two, three paragraphs, um, but it took a, a fair amount of work for them to put together the information needed to put this, uh, these posters in context. And so the first one is about nursing and the war and sort of the way these posters um, are, are selling the idea of nursing and what it, what it meant to the war. Um, the second one is about recruitment, um, the idea of how both these posters use women in sort of sexy poses to try and recruit men. Um, we've got students kind of grappling with and dealing with different aspects of the visual elements that they were looking at when we went to special collections. Um, this, this example is also a Mecca. This is from a History of Christianity course. And really quickly, if you look at the, the images, these are also images from uh, special collections. And here we've got students doing a little bit longer form writing. You can't see this, but these pieces were more like a traditional essay, a research paper type length um, of maybe what would have been uh, like a six page single, single spaced or uh, five page single spaced. Uh, piece of writing. Um, again, think of first year students, we're not talking upper, upper division, but they, again, they had the opportunity to put together these, um, these pieces. And these are students that chose to actually have them be public facing, as opposed to students who went through the same exercise and, and decided they didn't really want to publish at the end. Um, the other thing I want to point out about Omeka is that you can when you click on those images, and, and I don't have it set up so that you can do that here, but if you were to click on these images, part of what the students are doing is they have to put the image in and put all the metadata together about it. So they're researching the um, necessary information about what they're choosing to illustrate their article with um, as well. So these pieces are definitely using the, the um, items that we're looking at in special collections as a, a part of their research, not just an illustration to their research. So that's a, a really interesting way to go about it. It's a little bit time consuming because Omeka is a little difficult in terms of the setup. So I've got a couple other examples to give you a sense of some, some other ways you could go about this. This is using a WordPress uh, splot called TrueWriter. Um, if you've done any work with WordPress, you know there's all kinds of different plugins and setups and things that you can do. TrueWriter is a great a uh, really easy, uh, easy way to have students do short form writing. Basically, it sets up a form, the students come in, they upload a picture, they upload their writing, and, and they don't have to see the back end of it. So if you have a, a class where you don't necessarily want to go into the, the ins and outs of the programming side of, of how to put this together, this is a good way to do it. Um, so here's, here's the actual website about TrueWriter. Um, there'll be a link of it in, to it if you see the slides. And this is an example of that. We have two examples here, one on the scientific rev revolution, um, taking a look at the scientific revolution through one specific work, um, uh, Newton's optics. The one above it is about fencing, a book on fencing that we have in special collections, which is pretty amazing. And again, students picked a single text to kind of focus a question or focus a, a aspect of the, the historical time period that they were interested in. 
Um, so there's things like TrueWriter, but there's other ways you can use WordPress. And here's the, um, my, uh, I've got two final examples. This is a, a WordPress digital historical atlas. And in this case, students were writing and I we used maps, um, trying to get them to think about the, the space that we were discussing and how um, understanding the, the geography and the um, historical context together sometimes gives us more information and is, is useful. So these are the students uh, pages that he created about the First Crusade and, say, and the Siege of Jerusalem for this historical atlas project. Um, this one, WordPress is a little less fussy than Omeka. This was not a form. They did actually have to go in from the back end, but using the block editor was pretty simple. They didn't have to do any coding if they didn't want to. And then the final example is um, timelines that I've had started having students work on to put into our Pressbooks open educational resource. So if you've used any open educational textbooks, many of them are pretty bare bones, kind of like Rachel saw with the, the uh, Shakespeare texts. They don't have a lot of glossaries or um, annotations. And what I asked students to do is think about how they could potentially um, create something that would help us enrich that text that we were using. So we used H5P to create timelines. And this is an example of a student timeline for the pre-dynastic period in Egypt in a survey course. Um, we have a chapter on Egypt, and she did actually three different timelines for the pre-dynastic, or four timelines for the pre-dynastic, the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, the New Kingdom. And um, you'll notice here the texts are not very long, but basically she put together the timeline. Um, we then put it together with some images and uh, made this H5P timeline that then is inserted into the textbook. So just to, to wrap up, these are all just simple examples of, of ways that we've tried to create something that some of these websites are still kind of rough around the edges because they're literally the first iteration with each of these classes. I have created them in a way that hopefully now as I come back around the second time with, with students, they can, you know, tweak and add and we can, we can create layer upon layer of making this better and a more useful resource for students in the future. Um, and just be careful. Think about how you're going to use this assignment. If it's non-disposable, does it have to stay there forever? No. But um, what are you trying to do? And, and work with your students to articulate the choices that you're, that you're making about what part of their work is going to be open. Um, think about, you know, those options. When, when are those assignments not necessarily a good idea to, to be open? Um, failing forward is great, but sometimes there's also things you just are too sensitive or too, um, uh, it puts too much pressure on the students to, to have that element of, of open uh, forward facing. So you can still do these types of assignments, but maybe take a little bit of that pressure off in some ways. And then um, identify ways to infuse students' choice and options. So um, like we said, think about how they can have agency in what they're doing so that they'll have buy-in. So let's go now to our breakout uh, discussion. We decided to create a Padlet. This is something I actually use a lot for things that can also be non-disposable for a simple non-disposable assignments. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Padlet, but these can be made um, public. And so we're gonna go ahead and do some breakout groups with you all and ask you to think in your group um, about uh, what kinds of renewable assignments could you think of? Did, did any of what we talked about resonate with you or do you have some idea of your own that really is just inspiring you? Um, what excites you about any of your possible renewable assignments? What challenges do you think there might be? And what resources or technology or support might you need to meet those challenges? And in your group, if you can designate somebody as the scribe, um, they then can, with the link to the, the Padlet, um, click on the plus sign and just type in a couple phrases or sentences under each of these um, so that you can kind of record your thought process. And we'll, we'll bring you all back together and take a look at what you have thought about in a few minutes. So let's go ahead and uh, see about those breakout rooms. Carolyn? Yeah, so um, we're about to open up those breakout rooms. And um, as Nikki said, the link to the Padlet is in the chat. But please let us know if you have any questions about how to use Padlet or, or what it is we're asking you to do. But, but hopefully this will be a chance for 
all of you who've joined us today to learn expertise from one another. So I'm creating the breakout rooms now, and we'll call you back probably in about seven minutes or so, so we can wrap up before the end of this session. Some of the topics that um, you discussed in your breakout rooms. Um, if you'd like to unmute and speak, or if you'd like to raise your hand or comment in the chat. Do you want to put the Padlet back up? Yeah. And that way people can see what other groups have written too. student created study guides websites for real clients that's that's a lovely idea and that captures you know both the authentic real world problems as well as an audience beyond their instructor um, folks are excited about student engagement and the potential in renewable assignments some folks are expressing challenges with particular disciplinary areas and that brings us back to two questions that came in in the chat um, before we went to breakout rooms we added a couple of links in the chat where you can explore more examples one is an open pedagogy guide at cu boulder another is the open pedagogy network and often seeing how others in your field are doing it i think can be a really great source of inspiration um what else is here what do you think if it's not high quality of work or great examples for future students when posting this publicly um, Nikki, I know that you mentioned something in the chat. I don't know if you want to share your thoughts again verbally. Sure. I just I, I think one of the things that's really crucial is that yeah, students students know sometimes they are not producing um, their best work. And I think interestingly, sometimes those students already opt out of actually making their work public facing, which is fine. Um, I also kind of build a mechanism in where anybody who wants to publish can while we're doing the class, but I let them know that over the um, coming months after the class, there will be some editing and some pages will come down to make room for future classes. And that kind of gives me an out a little bit too, to pull some things here and there if there's something a little less than perfect for prime time that just feels like it's, it's not fitting the, the level that I'm hoping the site will go to. I so far have not done a ton of editing, but it, now as I'm going into the second iteration, I think that's going to start to happen with students. I was muted. I also wanted to share in response to another note on the Padlet, um, other authors who study open pedagogy. And on that guide link that we shared, there's some links to a number of writings and places where you can go to learn more um, and, and find inspiration as well. So we're right coming up to time. Um, and we're very, very grateful to all of you for, for joining us today and hope that it acted as a teaser to invite your curiosity and exploration of some of these ideas that we shared. Um, I wanna answer really quickly the, the violation of FERPA question. Um, it is, you can actually share things to a future class as long as students give the permission. So the whole thing about FERPA is that it, it, the students, you can't do share anything without permission, but if you get the student's permission that, that, or, that something is going to go on a public facing website, then it can be public facing. And that means not only students from a future class, but um, anybody potentially could look at it. So, so that's part of what they have to know before they actually contribute. And um, I also give them the opportunity to publish with their name or without. So um, they can do something anonymously. And so again, the questions of FERPA, you've got to make sure you cover those bases and they actually know what they're, what they're getting into when they make it public. Um, and then the other question on grades attached, I actually do attach grades to the assignment, but the grade is not attached to whether or not they make it public. I think Rachel does the same thing. 
I do, yes. Those are all great questions. And I added a link in the chat as well to an example, a permission document, especially if you're seeking to openly license content with students. And um, I, I wanna acknowledge that that comes out of work with two of my great colleagues in the library, Miranda McClure and Melissa Cantrell. All right, I think we're right at 9.50. So thank you again and, and wishing you all a wonderful and productive cult. Um, thank you so that. much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Just as a note, this session was recorded and should you should have access in the hub to rewatch it if you need to. Thank you. Thank you for your help, Ariel. Oh, no problem. Thanks.